morning, ladies and gents. I'm horrified to think there's any naughty tax authority in the room. I'm sure we're all honest, uh, paying the right amount of tax. My presentation this morning is going to cover two parts. Essentially, it's the um, budget review. Um, seven weeks now since George Osborne stood up on the 20th of March. And it seems like more than seven weeks, some time ago. Since then, of course, we've had the boat race. Oxford have won the boat race <coughs> again. We had a 66 to 1 mag romp home in the Grand National. We've had summer, been and gone, just today. Um, Margaret Thatcher's been and gone. And of course, for all you, you Forest fans in the room, that's to make the playoffs. So it's been a very action packed seven weeks. So what I thought it would be well worth doing was concentrating on what did happen on 20th of March, pulling out some salient points, planning for the years, and obviously just generally refreshing. And also, the second half of my presentation is um, introducing you to Pattern Box. Those of you that here last year will remember, perhaps not, but I did talk about Pattern Box then. And again, you might not think it's a massive relevance to you, but actually, it is a massive change. And I personally have the view it affects many, many businesses and many of you in the room. So, again, um, well worth trying to stay awake before we can. So, let's kick off then. So, business taxes, a lot of the budget these days is pre announced, so not a lot of surprise. There, um, apart from obviously there's the changes that's happening in April 15, uh, where tax um, rates for main companies is actually coming down to 20%. So what we've got from, from April, the current rate we're now in is 23%, <coughs> coming down to 21 next April, which is what we already knew was going to happen. And then just before the general election, we have the full rate of corporation tax at 20%, which is probably one of the lowest rates of corporate tax anywhere in the. Uh, world these days. What that also consequently means is the marginal rate, so where you are in the band for a single company of profits between that 300 and one and a half million, so that kind of marginal band of tax, then that rate in the past has been very expensive, obviously the rates fall, that marginal rate falls. So at the moment, for the current fiscal year, we're in the 23 and three quarters, um, the year before was 25, and obviously that rate will reduce down as the rate does reduce. Small companies rate, so companies whose corporation tax profits are sub 300,000 is remaining at 20%. So what effectively we've got is a realignment or an alignment actually for the first time of the corporation tax rates from April 15. So it's going to be a real good kind of pub question in the quiz now is 20% you know, is the rate of tax for what? Or for VAT, for income tax and for all levels of corporation tax. The thing that was mentioned actually in the pre-budget announcement back in December was that capital allowances, the effectively the first year allowance, the annual investment allowance, would be increased from 25 to 250,000 pounds. That obviously was again announced in the budget. Massive um, opportunity um, and presents real cash flow benefits. This is a two-year um, extension. 2013-2014 in terms of calendar years, who knows, it may well drift into 2015, but at the moment obviously that's not the plan, it will revert back I assume to 25,000. So that is a massive opportunity, and probably at the moment not that relevant in terms of planning around, but as we get towards the end of next year, if you are seriously thinking about capital investment in, in big items of plant and machinery, then one eye on those changes coming at the end of December 14, beginning of January 15, is significant. Moving back to 25,000 actually from a cash flow perspective means that you are benefiting, if you were to advance your capex into 2014, £44,000 is the cash flow benefit of pulling expenditure into 2014, not 2015. Obviously, don't want the tax tail to wipe the dog, but if you are in that game, then it's well worth considering. I think, as always in these presentations, we just try to kind of bring it to life, bit of numbers, and just illustrate the points that's been going on. So, the tax year just ended, or the fiscal kind of company tax year just ended to the end of March. What we had is, um, obviously, that slide there, so obviously we had the small, the marginal, and the full rate of tax, as, as stated. And if your profit profile for tax purposes that in the top line, that's what you'd expect to pay in terms of corporation tax, and therefore that's what your retained profits would be after corporation tax. Nothing hopefully too challenging in that. Let's just roll that forward now for the current year, only looking at the current year. 
So obviously looking at the full rate of 23%. Then the uh, benefit of that corporation tax reduction is that bottom line. So obviously no change at 300,000 because the rate stayed at 20%. But as the profits have started to increase beyond that point, then the corporation tax benefit has started to become a little bit more significant. Not massively, but a little bit more significant. Mirror that with then the changes that's going on in terms of income tax, which I'll pick up in a bit, and also how that would be in terms of extracting those profits via a dividend, then you can start to see that some quite sizable savings do, do pop out. So again, just looking at, picking up the previous slides, looking at your retained profits for 2012-13, so last year, that's what your profits would have been after corporation tax. If you'd extracted all the available profit after paying corporation tax, you'd have paid income tax at the effective rate for somebody earning over £150,000 of income, and effectively your income tax effective rate on the dividend would be 36.11. So that would be your personal taxes, and therefore that's what you would have in your back pocket as a shareholder, with obviously uh, an effective rate around the 50% mark. For this year, now again, modelling in the new corporation tax savings on the top line, combined with the fact that the marginal rate for dividend extraction has also fallen, so as income tax rates have come down by 5%, so effectively has the income tax rate on dividend extraction. So your net receipt is obviously in the third line across. Your effective rate, therefore, has effectively come down by about 5% across the piece. And, as you can see at the very bottom, if you were a company who had made £1.5 million pounds taxable profit, had paid the full amount of corporation tax, and extracted all the remaining reserves by way of dividend, then this current year, as opposed to last year, you're going to be £74,000 better off almost. Quite, you know, impressive numbers, I would suggest, and we're all just pondering for a second. Of course, as the rates continue to fall, for corporation tax, and we hit, head towards that 20% unified rate, then that 802 <coughs> becomes 833. So, starting to feel like the tax system isn't squeezing every last pip out of you, perhaps. Peter said, often get asked that question, you've had a great year, what's your advice around, should we take the extra, extra profit as a dividend, as a salary, as a pension contribution? Well, the general rule, as much as tax advisors like to give you a general rule, because it all depends, doesn't it? The general rule is that in most cases, 9 out of 10 cases, then actually still a dividend will outweigh bonus. As you see, as the rates of corporation tax fall, that becomes more more the case because if you do pay a bonus, a bonus itself attracts a corporation tax deduction, whereas a dividend doesn't. So the fact that the rates are coming down, the differential starts to become a bit more obvious as well. So actually, in most cases, I would suggest dividend does outweigh a bonus. Of course, there's no national assurance on dividends at the moment. There's been lots of talk over the last 10 years about governments trying to bring in a tax system that addresses SMEs, they've never really got it right, and I think it's very difficult to try and legislate for. There's nothing on statute book, but you never know, and you see at times what George Osborne or his successor will turn to next. But at the moment, no NI on dividends, because dividends are not an expense now in paid out accounts, so from a cosmetic reporting perspective, dividends get shown as a netting off of reserves, so you might want to be able to show a better P&L account to whoever read and use your accounts. And of course there's a cash flow benefit as well. There's no bonus, there's no pay as you earn, so there's no need to pay that tax over 14 days after the end of the tax month. <coughs> and there's a personal tax benefit as well, because you deal with that extra tax via your self-assessment return, typically the following January, after the end of the tax year. So all things being equal, the advice still remains that in most cases, a dividend does outweigh a bonus. Again, just looking at some numbers, this is what we're trying to, um, trying to model here. This is an appetite or a desire for an individual to have a net back, back pocket kind of uh, sum of £50,000. So what I've done is said, right, okay, the individual is already paying tax at the 40% bracket, their income is already at 50 k 
So get another 50k, they're safer still within that 40% of the band and not encroaching £150,000 income level. So if you do the maths backwards, 40% income tax, 2% national insurance, leaves you 58%. 58% of 86,207 pounds is 50,000 pounds. So what is the cost to the company of delivering 50,000 pounds in the back pocket of a shareholder? Well, it's uh, obviously the national insurance of 13.8, gets grossed up on the dividend, and then a full tax, corporation tax deduction, assuming there are profits available to offset that in the company and not losses. Then the cost of the company obviously goes down company is paying a higher marginal rate of corporation tax because the benefit becomes more of the corporation tax deduction. But of course is that the end column still shows you that there's no, um, no grossing up, there's no tax effectively for the company on the dividend. So a dividend cost of the company 66667 which for a sub £150,000 shareholder an effective rate on dividends 25% it delivers up £50,000 in the back pocket. So to deliver that £50,000, a dividend cost of the company is £66,000, and the calculations along the bottom show you the cost of the company, the varying rates of corporation tax. So again, dividends are better. And then just looking, looking that up again for this year, but actually it gets even more advantageous for a dividend because the corporation tax rates fall, therefore the corporation tax benefit falls, therefore the cost of the company increases of a, of a bonus. Most cases, dividends are the best. Okay, um, changing tax slightly, R and D tax credits. They've been around now for probably about ten years. Um, as I hope for you all um, know now, they are a very um, beneficial incentive. It's the tax system, hopefully, trying to kickstart some innovation, um, and it's effectively aimed at companies and only companies that develop particular products and processes. There's always been a misconception I've felt, hopefully we've dispelled that over the years, this is all to do with kind of high tech and many white coats. Like my business isn't doing that, I'm not entitled to R&D. That isn't the case. <coughs> R&D comes in many shapes and sizes and forms. And essentially, wherever you are resolving some kind of technological uncertainty, or you're pushing the boundaries of science, then you are potentially into R&D. For an SME, so a company with less than 500 employees, and a uh, turnover less than 100 million euros, and essentially you are into the small companies and marginal companies' benefits, which is 225% tax relief. So for every £100 that is, in, that is actually incurred, spent, and put through the PL account of the company, the tax system gives you another 125% of that figure, £25 in that case, tax relief against your corporation tax profits. So a massive benefit overall. If you are at a stage where you're not making corporation tax profits, perhaps there's losses, or the R&D deduction itself creates corporation tax loss, then you're able to surrender that benefit back to the Treasury for effectively 11% of the pound tax cash refund from the Treasury. That's all, new, that's all old news in some sense of the world we're just going over, just emphasising the R&D. Is an area we have over the last couple of years really helped many, many businesses, hopefully quite a few in this room, to unlock some value for tax relief. The change, and for completeness, I put on the bottom, probably, if I'm honest, affect many of you in the room. It's all to do with this above the line tax credits, and it applies really only for large publicly listed companies. And what, what's going on there essentially is to encourage big companies who are clearly driven by their profits, by their reported profits, by their EBITDA, whatever it is, they're sometimes reluctant to expense R&D. And the benefit, of course, on a tax credit goes below the line in terms of the tax charge. And what, what effectively the, um, the government is saying is for the big companies that incur R&D, you can bring that tax credit that's associated on that spend above the line. It's effectively out of the tax charge and above your, your EBITDA reportable figures. That will be a taxable credit, but it'll be only taxable at 10%. Effectively, it's an offset against your corporation tax liability. So, I think there's pressure being, being 
put on, on the government by the big companies to try and do something and to kind of slowly kind of balance the, the equilibrium between the SMEs and the large companies. Of course, large companies also remunerate key executives on profits. And I think the R&D department of big corporates have been saying for a while this is all fair on us, we want to bring that credit into our bonus calculation as well. So that's the change. Again, happy to talk about it a bit further if you're interested, but that's probably not a massive application. EMI, this is again partly new news and partly old news, but again worth <coughs> emphasising. EMI, in my opinion, is one of the best tax incentives that the tax system gives business. Essentially, it's all about helping businesses recruit, retain and recruit key individuals, important members of staff, employees and directors to drive the business forward in the future. And as long as awards are given, effectively granted at market value, then the tax system says there is no tax at the point of grant, there's no tax at the point of exercise, and the only tax is on the individual, and it's, it comes in the form of capital gains tax. And it comes at the point of, of exit or selling shares, which probably is the same point. So there's no income tax, no national insurance, there's no capital gains, or no corporation tax at any point other than at the end of when the shares are sold. Again, that's not hopefully new news. What is new is that many, 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 many options are what we call exit options. So they only crystallise at the point in which the company is going to be sold. So typically, um, people into business, he thinks I'm quite a decent chap, he's prepared to give me 5% share option, only exercisable if and when he sells is 100%. Clearly, if he didn't do that, then he'd be slightly diluted and I'd get 5%. But in most cases, that only applies on exit. And the beneficial rates of, court, of capital gains tax or entrepreneurs' relief didn't actually help option holders because there was two criteria that were, that were never met. One typically was the sub 5%. So typically, in that example, people's given me 5%. Because when you take into account, I've now got 5 on 105, that's like 4.8, that's not 5%. So actually, I would not get entrepreneurs' relief. So whilst I'd still be paying capital gains tax at the point of sale, I'd be paying it for 28% and not 10% for the benefit of entrepreneurs' relief. The change that came in last budget, just to re-emphasise that, was that 5% only for EMI option holders is being removed. So if I only now own 2%, I can still attract entrepreneurs' relief on my sale. The final piece of the jigsaw, which is being lobbied for for a while, is the 12 month holding period. So, again, entrepreneurs' relief after to own 5% of the shares in a trading company for at least 12 months. Because the options are undoubtedly always ex option, sorry, exit options and are exercisable at the moment of sale. You probably own these shares for five minutes between the lawyers doing the various documents never get into that 12 month holding period. Fortunately, that 12 month holding period has now been extended to include the period over which the grant of the option exists. So if Pete, in that example, granted the options two years ago, and actually he only exercised them five minutes before sale, the fact I've had the option for two years means I now qualify for entrepreneurs with it. So a massive benefit. And it you know, continues to be a massive benefit, in my opinion. And I think that those changes now make it probably second to none in terms of the ability to remunerate and to incentivise key employees within the business. A mixed bag of points here, all to do with changes around employment taxes. So, from April 14, the exempt threshold for benefit kind purposes or beneficial loans is going to be increased from five to ten thousand. And that was just talked about mainly in terms of London and South East, season tickets for travel, for train, etc., where employees tend to lend money to, to employers, lend money to employees. That effectively that first ten thousand now will be exempt from the benefit kind calculation for next year. Loans to participators is where a typically a close company makes a loan to a shareholder, 
And if you remember, there's rules around that has to be repaid within nine months of the company's year end, otherwise there's, a, there's effectively a 25% deposit has to be paid over to HMRC. There's been abuse of that in terms of how individuals are being both shareholder directors of companies and also they've been partners in NLP partnerships. Clever people have been trying to mix and match so that you can kind of get out of these rules. These rules are being tightened such so that can't happen. If you are effectively the same person, whether I'm a partner in the partnership, I'm also a director, shareholder in the company, I'm called, the company's called. And the other change is the bed and breakfast, D and B. Where again, what I, what I said was if you are having to pay your um, loan back within nine months, or typically during nine months they're paying the loan back, and then two days later they'll be re advancing the money, and then again, you can sell for another 12 months of cash flow benefit. If that's going on, then there'll be no relief under section 455 anymore. Another couple of points at the bottom are all to do with kind of share ownership plans. You've probably seen the third point, it's had some kind of mixed press. This is where employees are effectively waiving some of their employment rights in respect of, of, of employment law in exchange for taking on some shares in the company. It was going to start in April, it's been delayed until September. Essentially, if that is happening and there's some tax benefits going on, the first £50,000 of any gain that arises on those subsequent shares are sold will be free from CGT. And from an employment related securities perspective, those shares are deemed to have a base cost of income tax purposes of £2,000. Not sure what the reaction is and whether people don't actually use this much, but anyway, time will tell. And then the, th the final point, which is kind of play banging the agenda about John Lewis, this is coming in, in April 14. The, the situation where if you were a controlling shareholder and in a kind of an MBO scenario, say where you're selling out to effectively an employee owned structure, where you've got your employees owning a big proportion of the company, then there's going to be some effectively CGT relief on the vendor, again, following that John Lewis model. Don't know how it's going to be received, um, but they're the outline tax plans at the moment. Obviously, there's no more meat on the bones at the moment, but there will be, we get over the next 12 months. Um, Sundry slide on VAT, so just to make you aware that from April, the registration and demonstration limits have just been moved up slightly, I guess, in line with RPI. Quick look at personal taxes. The figures in bold are the changes. So the higher rate, additional rate, sorry, the higher rate stays at 40, basic rate stays at 20. The additional rate, the tax levied on incomes over £150,000 has come down from 50 to 45%. I think there were some stats issued by the Treasury which taking action tax take in those three years where income tax was at 50 actually fell. Because it was clever people who were avoiding it. Um, and the consequential impact on dividends, as I said already, <coughs> dividend rate effective has come down from 36.11 to 30.6. And then some headline changes around trust at the bottom. And then rates and allowances, well, again, we've got, we've got Lib Dems um, manifesto commitment up here a year early. Personal allowances from April 14 are going to hit £10,000, one year earlier than they promised. And there's been an acceleration on the figure for this current tax year. It was announced about, about 9,200, it's gone to 9,440. What we have got, of course, at the bottom is clawing that back, essentially, because at the <coughs> moment, the point in which you enter the higher rate is about 34,500. It's coming down, has come down now to 32,010, and again coming down in 2014-15. So there's that fiscal drag going on where people are entering the 40% band quicker. So when you add together the personal allowance and the point, and the point at which you start to pay 40% tax, actually, surprise, surprise, you work so It looks like that's your right, doesn't it? Who'd be a politician? <coughs> IHT, um, we were hoping that there would be some slight relaxation in the mill rate ban that was promised for 2015. It's now in these austere times and pushed out for two years, so it's now going to be frozen at that level until 2017-18. There's changes also around non-DOM non um, UK, non -UK spouses. So typically, <coughs> a UK domiciled husband, 
who had a US, Canadian, Australian domiciled wife. Since inheritance tax was introduced in 1986, there was always a limit around how much of the transfer between a husband and wife would be exempt. In normal situations, as I'm sure you're aware, UK to UK domiciled spouses, there's no, there's no um, limit. So effectively, it's always exempt for inheritance tax purposes. Since 1986, that rate has always been 55,000, beyond which that would be treated as a pet for inheritance tax purposes. That has now been uh, done away with, I think, probably long, long, long overdue. And some other technical changes around tax anti avoidance, around what's deductible in your inheritance tax estate. So typically, they have to be proper liabilities, repayable on death to lender. There can be no deduction now for loans to buy property, which for IHT purposes is excluded property, which seems logical because if the property is excluded and not in your estate, it would be unreasonable to suspect you'd get a deduction for something that wasn't chargeable. And the final point I think is quite um, important to, to recognise. If you have assets that are protected by either BPR, business property relief, or APR, agricultural property relief, such that that relief is 100%, so your um, amount in your estate rights to is zero, then you can no longer offset any debts associated with that property that effectively will dip you below zero. That was the budget. I've got five minutes just on patent box. Um, <coughs> as I said at the beginning, I'm of the personal opinion, this does actually affect many, many people in this room who probably don't think it does. This has come about through pressure from the likes of companies of like um, James um, Dyson and other innovators, entrepreneurs within the UK, who have felt for a while that the UK system doesn't actually reward <coughs> innovation and development. We've had R&D, R&D has been around for about 10 years. What R&D is about, obviously, is the research and the development of the idea of pattern box then to just take that on commercial exploits it, protects it. So what we're seeing really is kind of a bolting on to the existing <coughs> R&D benefits. What Patent Box is all about is that starting now, so from April, April 2013, we are entering a phase where over the next five years, the headline rate of corporation tax that can be identified from patented income and profits reduces to 10%. There's a sliding scale on the next graph, the next slide. It's all about driving forward innovation and actually making taxes to reward UK companies. So that's the phasing through. So how it, how it works at the moment is that the current rate for this year is 23, the headline. The, the, um, the aspiration is to get to 10 in five years. So the difference between 23 and 10 this year is 13%. The relief is at 60%. So 60% to 13% is 7.8% take 7.8 away from 23 uses 15.2. Now this is going to be very, very difficult in practice to actually to identify. Whilst the policy is admirable and states the intent, I think um, to get within the requirements, you know, to take quite a bit of doing, at least be alive to what the requirements are. It's all about qualifying patents that are granted to a, um, a UK-based company that has patents worldwide. The only patents that are registered with the UK and the European Patent Office. So this stage excludes patents registered in the likes of China, Japan, the States, it's just EEA and Europe and, and, and UK patents. There's a development requirement. So you can't just simply buy a patent and just sit there and do nothing with it. It's not like a second-hand purchase of a patent. It's something you are constantly developing. You are actively involved in development, you're actively involved in decisions around the patent, whether you should apply for the patent, whether you should incur money protecting any infringements of that patent. The rules apply when the patent is granted. There will be a six year look back period. So if you have a patent that's pending and takes a number of years to get patent approval, and once patent approval is obtained, say in 2020, you can look back to 2014 retrospectively your patent box rates. This is the devil in the detail. It's actually unlocking what rate of tax you apply to these patented profits. As I've said, it's all around worldwide sales. 
and it's all about exclusive licenses being, licenses being granted over those patents. Again, last year I mentioned this, and it's a massive application because if you are someone like Ford Motor Company and produce Fiesta and charge £10,000 to the end user, and that Fiesta has a patented set of brakes within it, say £500,000 component, the fact that you've then got a component of the main product that is patented means, believe it or not, the whole the profit attributed to sale of that Ford Fiesta, £10,000 of income, is in the patent box. Slide. Oh, okay. it's a one. Now, as an accountant, this slide blows my mind. So I was always taught as a school that a circle in that way and a pie chart is even percent. And when the guys presented it to me, I said, I can't show that. Now, what it's trying to show is that on the green sector, that is all the patent profits that associate clearly from the patent. I think there's no, no dispute they are within the patent box. The yellow, is normal non-patented income, so you'd expect that to be taxed at the normal tax rate. The bits in the middle are interesting, the grey, and it really is grey, because what the revenue is saying in this calculation is that whilst you might have some profits that come off the patent, we would nevertheless expect a, a regular routine of a business in a company in business to make some to make some financial returns from things around marketing, <coughs> development. So they kind of take away a bit of that cake. So whilst it's 10% headline, the reality is, of course, that that won't quite be the case. It will be probably slightly up to 12, 13%. That said, still beneficial, given the headline rate of corporation tax of 4 to 20%, still massively um, attractive. But as I said, devil's in the detail. It's not an easy calculation. So the purpose, really, of flagging it again this morning is saying we are in the new rules. Those rules did start in April. But really, we ought to be getting prepared now over the next few years to make sure we make the most of this. So, as companies, do we know if we hold qualifying IIP? Importantly, do our accounting systems give us the ability to capture that financial data that they can differentiate between financial returns from patented profits, products, and, and non-patented products? Can our systems give us that, give us that information easily? What is our behaviour within the company to, to, towards patents? Should we be changing it slightly, perhaps, again, not wishing for the tax tail to wag the dog, but should we be changing it to recognise that some items are patented and available for 10% of the or some aren't? But to my mind, this is all about, in the life of the issue, and planning and preparing for it now. Again, in my personal opinion, the patent box are indeed taken together are massive opportunities to apply in a big, wide-scale way. I hope to many of you in the audience. That's me done. Um, as Peter said, there will be Q&A at the end. I'm going to bring down at um, the end my, um, my manager who's heavily involved in Pattern Box and R&D. If you've got any technical questions, introduce you to him.